Too early to wish you guys a Merry Christmas, no? I don't know, the people have different rules about that. But uh, speaking of Christmas, uh, just as a reminder guys, um, because of everything going on, we're trying to be safe this year, and so this year's Christmas Eve service will be online, um, but not in person this year, just to keep everyone safe. And so please uh, join us online for that this year. Uh, just a few more announcements to, uh, today. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of great things uh, this coming year, and we want to kind of launch it off with uh, fasting and prayer. And so from January 3rd to 10th, we're going to have a fasting and prayer with the whole denomination of the BIC. And as you guys already know, there's plenty of, to, plenty of things to pray about, and uh, we really need God's uh, intervention and power to get through this season, because it's going to be over but we need to be praying and fasting as a church. And so I hope you guys can join us for that. Uh, from 8.30 to 4.30 p.m., there's going to be um, prayer. And you guys can just come into church when you guys uh, have some time. Take some time to pray. Take some time to just be with God and uh, pray over those things. Uh, the next thing we're going to try to do this year, or we are going to do this year, is uh, a Bible reading. We're going to go through the entire Bible this year. And, uh, yeah, I feel like we really need to kind of have a kind of a revival in our hearts and so and in, in our minds and our souls. And so we want to read through the entire Bible this coming year. And so we made a chronological list. And so we're going to hand those out every quarter and um, we'll be going through the Bible, the entire Bible. And so we did it one time I, with the... Uh, What's the thing called? The story. But this time we're going to actually be reading, you know, the entire Bible in your version that you prefer. ESV, NIV, whatever that is. And uh, lastly, actually two more things. Uh, membership class, uh, we are going to tentatively move it to March um, because of everything going on. And hopefully that will be in person if we're lucky. So membership class, if you guys signed up, it will be moved to March. And the last thing is um, we really want to thank you for your faithful giving, especially uh, the end of your giving. Uh, we know that times are very difficult for everybody, uh, businesses, churches, families, and the like. And so we really want to encourage you guys to just continue uh, just being faithful with that. We, our church relies on giving as well. And so I just want to thank you and uh, continue to do that. Uh, with that being said, we're just going to start with uh, prayer and uh, we'll jump into worship. Jesus, uh, we want to say happy birthday to you. God, this uh, season we make it so much about the decorations and the trees and the lights and the presents, but God, we want to usher your presence here in our hearts, in our church, in our community, Lord. And so I pray right now that um, you would accept all of our praise and our worship, God, because we truly do worship and love you. Lord, would you bless your people today? And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
For those who don't know what his name is, you've seen him around for years now. His name is Dave Olivas. He's our bass player. And he's going to bring the Advent candle this week. Is this, is, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is David Olivas, just like Jimmy said. Um, <laughs> and he asked me to kind of, I guess, introduce myself and say a few words about my life and my walk with Christ. Um, so I made some notes, and I brought some props. So got to open my Bible. Got a lot of echo going on here in this microphone. So they're not really long notes. I just wrote down a couple of things. And I know a lot of us are focused on 2020 and what kind of year we had. Well, I'm just going to say 2016 and 2017 were probably, I'm not going to say the worst, but probably the most challenging two years that I went through. Um, I don't know about, I can only speak for myself in that I argued with God about my life and I wondered, why in the world are you putting me through so many challenges, um, you know, and different things that were going on? Um, I wasn't working and I should go back, maybe back to 90, 1990, and that I had uh, graduated and from a prestigious university and I had a really good job, and I've been doing it for years. And then the job went away, and I floundered around trying to find new work, trying to pay the bills. And I just got to a point, really, God? Don't you love me? Don't you care about me? And it was really interesting. Right about that time, somebody came knocking on my door. And I know you've had the knock before, but it wasn't who I thought it was, as far as a religion. But it was somebody that gave me this DVD, and it's called Theodicy. And I'm, not a, I'm not a minister. I've never went to ministry school or anything like that. But I decided to watch it, and it was almost like God was talking to me in that it refers to the book of Job, now, I'm not going to read to you the book of Job, but I got it open here. <laughs> and I'm just going to read you the theme. And it was, in this particular, in my Bible, it was really, really interesting because when I opened it up, it started on page 777. So, I don't know, maybe that's telling me something. But in the theme, the book says, wrestles with old aid question, why do righteous men suffer if God is a God of love and mercy? And so I started to study it. I started to read, um, look at this DVD on theodicy. And it just kind of really opened my mind and my eyes to all the good things that God has done in my life. Now, if you were to look at my Facebook page and look at 2016 and 2017, you would look and see, well, Dave's life wasn't that bad. It was pretty good. My daughters had, were in high school and very successful at what they were doing. Um, but little did you know, you had, I had utilities being turned off and then turned back on and that sort of thing. And then on the end, and then in one part of my life during that, uh, my one daughter was crowned homecoming queen. But also the, the trials of that year sitting at my dad's bedside and watching him die. And that was really, really a challenge, to be next to him and to talk to him about Christ and God loves him in hopes that he would accept Christ on his final days. And that was really troubling for me because, you know, here's somebody you, you grew up and respected and he was a hardworking man. And it was just... You know, you get to that point, it's like, why God? And you know what? It's these sort of things that put us through when it comes to year 2020. And I kind of realized back then, maybe I was, I was backlapsing a little bit. I wasn't a grown-up, an adult as a Christian. I was acting more as a baby 
or as a youngster, having a tantrum. Okay. <laughs> so, so it really, it really kind of made me think about my walk or where I'm going. And here we are, you know, 2019, I'm back to the same challenges I had before, but I just had faith that God was going to take care of me. And here again, I'm thinking, I should be able to get that job. You know, I graduated from a prestigious university. And, uh, you know, I had quite the resume. And um, so I'm a little bit more than just playing my bass guitar, which I love. But here I go back to work, basically doing a job that doesn't require even a high school degree. And so, uh, working at UPS, if anybody knows. <laughs> so here I am in my 50s, uh, unloading a trailer. And, uh, and if anybody's ever done that job, it's it was probably the most physical job I've ever had in my entire life. Would you, would you jump in and you start unloading boxes and boxes and, and you just, you know, you kind of hope, it's like, boy, I hope this isn't a good year trailer where it's nothing full of tires, you know? <laughs> so, so it was really a challenge. And then again, I started asking, it's like, I didn't have the tantrum, but I started, it's like, okay, God, why am I here? What is this? It's like, you know, it's, it's providing a little bit, but not what I was before. And it's only part-time. There must be a reason why I was here. And then I started to realize that it's not always about me. It's not always about what I want. And I think when God puts you in a situation or a place, then maybe it's for others. And so I, I started to meet those around me, and I started talking to them and started finding out their situations and what was going on in their lives. And come to find out that my, my coworker, um, I was like, yeah, what, what have you been up to? What's your life like? And he was it's like, well, you know, I just got out of jail. <laughs> and, you know, and the funny thing, his name was Manuel. And if anybody's ever understood, and now that we're in the year of Christmas, we know that Emmanuel means God among us. But here we have a man that was just kind of on a path that didn't, he, doors were kind of opening for him, but I became friends with him. And we started talking and, and you know, it just, you just never know what, what God's going to do and where God's going to place you and how you're going to help. And I started looking back on my, my life that God has always used me in a certain way, or, you know, maybe it's not necessarily all about financial gain or having a bigger house or a nicer car. And, um, you know, it's, sometimes it's, it's, it's more than that. In many ways, it's a lot more than that. And I think one of my lowest lows was, you know, when the lights weren't on. And I stood outside and I had my iPhone and I was listening to some Christian music. And I think I was listening to the third day and uh, God of Wonders. And in there, there's a line that says, in the darkness I stumble. And I think we've all been there. I certainly have. Where we kind of stumble through life and then we bring ourselves to 2020. How am I doing on time? I'm doing all right on time? Good. And then we come to 2020. And I'll be honest, to me, 2020 has also had its challenges. But in many ways, it's almost kind of been a cakewalk because I've kind of been through the ringer physically and mentally, emotionally. Um, and I know that there is a God and that he loves me and he loves you. And as long as we place our faith in him, we're going to come out of this okay. And in some of the things I look back on as far as this year, 2020, I'm diabetic. I spent five days in the hospital. I, um, the diabetes, I had, a, I had a, a blister on my toe. I popped it. I was stupid. Um, and then it got infected. And I ended up five days at San Antonio, just over the street here. And I had my toe amputated. So I was at a commission from work. I'm still at a commission from work. Um, but it just made me think, it's like, okay, why? Why did this happen to me? And I don't know why I keep saying that because God has a plan. 
And during that time, I was able to reconnect with some old friends. I had one friend call me up, and he was talking to me about some of his music. I said, you know what? You, we need to get together. And he goes, well, that's why I was calling, because I heard you were sick. And then I heard, and then our good friend, Chris Bergen, who's a friend of, of Jimmy and I's, uh, we just started working on some music, and we started recording. And, um, you know, stuff that probably I would have never done had I been working and not been at home trying to find something to do other than watch Netflix and Hulu. And so we started working on some music. And then my friend came down from Northern California, and we spent a day together, and we started recording. And something's going to come out of that, too. So, it, it, and, you know, and, and you know, my family, my daughters, getting to know them better. Um, I love my kids. I love my daughters. But we are totally on different sides of the political spectrum. <laughs> so, you know, trying to learn to kind of not, you know, hold anger and angst against others because they may not necessarily agree with you. Talk about a learning experience. And so to get to know them and love them for who they are. And so just in closing, I just want to say that, you know, we're going to get through this. Christmas this year is totally going to be different than it's, it has been in my family. We have 100 people come over to my aunt and uncle's house. And we make probably eight cans of tamales, which are those big cans. And, and we, uh, it's, it's basically a family reunion. But unfortunately this year, because of what's going on, even with my mom being in the hospital for a few days because of pneumonia, we just, you know, it's, this year has totally been different for us. But I think there's joy and there's positives that we can find in this. I know that there is. And so I just want to thank you so much for letting me share who I am and a little bit of my story. And just like to say, God bless you. I guess I'm supposed to light something. Thank you, David. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you? This child that you've delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will calm a storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby Walked where angels trod, and when you kiss your little baby, you've kissed the face of God. Oh, Mary, did you know?
Did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect land? And the sleeping child you're holding is the great I Sunday. Uh, we've been reflecting the last number of weeks on Christmas journeys. I want to thank Dave. Thank you, brother, for uh, sharing us a bit of, uh, of your journey, as uh, rocky as it's been. Um, we've talked about uh, the journey of Mary and Joseph from Nazareth to Bethlehem. We've talked about the wise men making their 800-mile journey from uh, Babylon uh, to uh, Bethlehem. Last week we talked about shep the shepherds who made a short journey, being in the Judean hills right there around Bethlehem, but the cultural leap that they had to make because they were outsiders, and we called them misfits last week, was huge. All of these individuals make up this Christmas story, and each of their individual Christmas journeys fit into the larger story. I started thinking this week about what are some of the greatest journeys of all time. I don't know what would come to your mind, but uh, some that came to my mind, and this probably goes back to, I don't know, did you listen in high school to your history classes? I don't know. There are some uh, discoverers by the name of Columbus and Magellan and Cook that circumnavigated the world and discovered new lands for their countries. It's a little bit before all of our times, but Charles Lindbergh in 1927 made uh, an epic journey flying across the Atlantic for the very first time. It took him 33 and a half hours. How long does it take from New York to Paris now? Three hours, three or four hours, something like that. 33 and a half hours, and he was greeted in Paris by 100,000 strong as he concluded that historic journey across the Atlantic. And then my own lifetime, probably the, the one I remember the most was uh, Apollo 11, 1968 journey to the moon. Uh, do you remember where you were? Uh, the, well, some of you are like, I wasn't here. I was not born. But for those of you who are born, I was down in Newport Beach. I remember the streets were empty as people were in glued to their TV sets watching uh, those two gentlemen step onto the surface of the moon. You think of... Uh, all of these adventurers, all of these discoverers that have traveled near and far. But strangely this week, I thought about another journey. Before we get to the Bible journey that we're going to think about, I, I just want, I think God wanted me to share this journey with you. Uh, it seemed more like the Christmas journey than any of the other ones that I mentioned and again, I'll explain it later on. Do you remember a couple of years ago, there were these uh, 12 boys that got lost in a cave in, uh, in Thailand? Uh, if you don't recall that story, it was, uh, they were 12 boys aged 11 to 16, and then their 25-year-old soccer coach, they became trapped in a cave that was two and a half miles deep into a mountain in Thailand. And uh, they were just kind of going for a short hike, so they thought, a little ways in, a couple of miles in this cave, which they knew very well. When they got in there, all of a sudden, torrential rain started. And any of you who have been in, in that part of the world know that the rains can come fast and furious. Well, they became trapped 
two and a half miles deep into a cave with no way out. They had air, they had water, they had torches, but they had no food. And they were trapped on a narrow ledge inside this cave for over two weeks. Well, the Navy SEALs were called into service. Rescue specialists arrived from around the world, from the U.S., the U.K., Belgium, Australia, Scandinavia. It seems like the whole world descended on the mouth of this cave in Thailand. The rescue effort included 10,000 people. Can you imagine that? They had to build up an entire makeshift city over the course of just a few days there at the mouth of that cave. A hundred divers, 900 police, 2,000 soldiers. All of these converged on this place because these 13 were lost in the cave. Well, it was nine days into the rescue effort when the first two British divers first discovered the boys. They said when they popped their heads up, they could smell them before they could see them. Now, you can just imagine, I won't, I won't make any joke, jokes about junior high boys, but <laughs> you can only imagine. The two divers reached them, found out, amazingly, all 13 were still alive. And so they began to, to go back and forth, bringing people to support them and bringing food. And, and one diver even died when he ran out of air trying to reach the boys. He was 38 years old. Once they reached the boys, they still had to figure out how to get them out because half of the caverns had filled up with water from the rains. And so really half the way out, over a mile, you could climb over rocks, but the other mile was underwater. And so they had to figure out how to do this. Through an ingenious system of ropes and pulleys, the boys were eventually ready to go, and they were given masks. They were told to hold on to a, a, a canister of air. They attached handles onto their backs so that they could kind of move them out like a, like a suitcase, you know? I'm trying to imagine this. And then they sedated them because a number of the boys didn't even know how to swim. And one by one... They took him on that long journey to safety. And not one of them was lost. Not one of them. The, it seems like the whole world celebrated. The head, uh, one BBC news correspondent tweeted, he said, they're all out. The Navy SEAL team in charge of the rescue says, everyone trapped in the cave has been brought out completing an extraordinary and arduous rescue operation that has captivated the entire world, end quote. And the head of the Thai Navy SEAL said, there was only a tiny bit of hope, but in the end, that tiny bit of hope became reality. So I thought about this story this week. I really think God brought it to mind. Could have talked about a million different kinds of journeys that people are on. I couldn't help but think, you know what? Yeah, Christmas is like that. Christmas is like that. The whole point of Christmas is God coming to earth to rescue a world that is lost. And God is relentless in his, in his wanting to reach the people that he so loves and who are so lost. God views us as deep in that cave and lost beyond belief. Maybe we don't even know how lost we are, but God does. That's why I call this story this morning the greatest journey of all. If you have your Bibles, and I, I, I want you to know, uh, I'd like you to go to John chapter 1. I didn't get together anything for up here this morning. Oh, that's nice. You can stare at that. But I... I really trust that as you become engaged here at UBIC, that you bring Bibles or you have a Bible app or something, that you don't depend on the slides or for Pastor Bishop Perry to get the slides together to put up there. And if you just want to sit and listen this morning, these are good stories. But in John chapter 1, I'd like to read John's account of this greatest journey of all. I'm going to explain it because it may not be 
readily apparent some of the language he uses, but, uh, but we will we'll talk about that in a few minutes. John chapter 1, down to verse 14, and I'm going to read sections, and I'll just tell you where I'm jumping from section to section. Chapter 1, first one of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, you may not know by now, but it's talking about Jesus. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Go down to verse 10. He, and that is referring to Jesus, the Word, was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born, not of natural descent, nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. Then verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. Your version may say say, uh, the only begotten. The glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then look at verse 18. I'll refer to this later on. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Let's pray before we get started. God, on this wonderful morning where we have come to celebrate your birth into this broken, darkened world, we pray that you would speak to us this morning, deeper in our hearts maybe than we've gone all Christmas season long. Speak into our hearts about your love for us and the ends to which you will go to rescue us from whatever it is that's holding us deep in the recesses of the darkness of this world. Open your word to us now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So I don't know if you see the connection between that that cave story and, and this passage that I read, because one of the things about this passage, John chapter 1, that's always meant so much to me, is that it speaks of the reality of the ends to which God will go to reach human beings, to restore relationship. And so I want to talk about this greatest journey of all, and I'll, I'll kind of use the analogy of the, the boys lost in the cave. Hopefully it'll make some sense. The first thing that this passage tells us about this this greatest journey of all, is that it's a journey God himself made. That's the main point. If you get that, that's good this morning. God made this journey himself. In the first uh, uh, three verses, it's packed full with deep theological uh, understanding. But let me just tick these off and tell you what it says about this word. Again, The word was a reference that John used to talk about Jesus to a a Greek audience. The word means logos in Greek, it's logos, and it basically means God's expression of who he was, God's revelation of himself, who God is in his very essence is the logos of God. And so when John talks about the word, he's talking about Jesus being uh, God himself. He's the logos. And so 
even though it's harder for us to understand, and John then later on talks about Jesus as Jesus, but here he wanted to capture the attention of these philosophical Greek readers because he wanted them to be drawn in so they wouldn't think that it was just Jews that were included in this good news, okay? So here's what, what John says about God making this journey. First of all, he says, in the beginning was the word. When you hear those words, in the beginning, what do you think about immediately? Genesis. It's the very first words of the Bible. In the beginning. And so John was saying, I, I want you to understand that this, this word, this logos, Jesus, was in the beginning, was eternal from the foundations of the earth. And so right there, we understand that this is not just some, uh, some unique expression of God. This is God himself. He's eternal. In the beginning was this word. He's divine. It says the word was with God, and the word was God. And then he says, emphasizes again, Jesus' eternal nature. Verse 2, he was with God in the beginning. And then in verse 3, he talks about Jesus being the creator of the universe. He says, in, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In other words, are you getting this picture of this, this person, this being who is making this journey, John is saying, is the very God that we worship as the God Almighty. God makes the journey. God makes the journey. In verse 4, it says, in him was life. And then in verse, uh, then he says, he was the giver of light. And that life, in verse 4, it says, the word Jesus, that life was the light of men. Verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. The point is, is that all of these things are referring to Jesus who came to earth. You know, this baby in the little manger that we're talking about, and we celebrate and we put in our little, our little uh, manger scenes. I need a manger scene. Uh, this is God himself. The, the journey, the rescue party, the rescue effort was so incredibly important to the heart of God that God said, I'm going to make the journey myself. Uh, all bets are off. I am going to make this journey. And I'm going to come to earth to save those who are lost. I don't know if you feel like you're deep in a cave and you're, uh, or you're in darkness or whatever. But you need to understand that this is what compelled God to make this journey. The point here is that the word is God. Jesus is God, and God himself made the greatest journey of all. But I want to bounce this down to verse 14 now, because the second point I want to make is that God made the journey by taking on human flesh. God made the journey by taking on human flesh. The beginning of verse 14 is a powerful verse. Underline it, circle it, highlight it, do whatever you can do on your phone to make it special. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Stop and think just of the magnificence of that statement. God, in the form of Jesus, took on flesh and came to the earth. And Eugene Peterson translates it and says, he moved into the neighborhood. He took on human flesh and I've always tried to imagine, you know, some of you watch The Masked Singer. Is that a, a show on TV now? They come out and they're in these, these things, uh, these costumes and, and these masks, and they're, they're supposed to sing and be guests and stuff like that. I'm just trying to think, how can the God of the universe get into this human form? How about a seven-pound baby? God in the flesh. He became flesh and made his dwelling among us. 
Here's where I go back to my opening analogy. He came and dwelled among us. He came to where we are in our greatest need. There's no way in the world we could have gotten to heaven to pull ourselves out of the cave in which we find ourselves. As a matter of fact, it says the boys, when they found them, the boys deep in that cave, they had been digging to try and find a way out. And they were two and a half miles in that cave, and they had dug 13 feet. And you just think about how, how we try everything in our own power to try and get out of the funk that we're in, to try and rescue ourselves in some way, shape, or form, and God is just like going, you know what? <laughs> you can keep digging. I'm going to come and get you. And so God came to earth. God had to come to where we are because we can't get to where God is. No way. We needed some way to be able to bridge this gap. And Jesus was that way. And God said, I'm coming to earth. My name's going to be Jesus while I'm down there for 33 years. And I'm going to die for the sins of humanity. Imagine. What a journey. I've been asking some of the staff this week, saying, uh, how far do you think it is from heaven to earth? Now, have you ever thought about it? How far is it from heaven to earth? Everybody just kind of looked at me like, do you have something you should be doing? You know, <laughs> like, going, yeah, I'm thinking about this. I don't know if we could even comprehend, and, and I think it was Daniel told me it's, oh, it's different dimensions, you know, this dimension, that, and he lost me on that. All I'm, I'm just thinking in terms of, is it a billion miles, a trillion? How far did God have to come to reach us in our state? See, love makes you do crazy things. Have you understood that? Love makes you do just really crazy things. When, when you love someone, you go to where their need is, and you will do anything for them. That's what Marta and I did in June when we found out that Sophie, our daughter, who lives in Seattle by herself, was in a terrible living situation. As a matter of fact, she is, she is on the sixth story of this not a very good place in a, uh, in a room... Uh, it's called a micro studio. It's probably about a quarter of this stage. I mean, she was there, and people were starting to let people in the building, and they were sleeping in the stairwells. And this was the time when the social uprising was happening, and, and a group of knuckleheads took over a neighborhood uh, just a few blocks away called Chaz, Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. I'm going to make my house an autonomous zone, just like wall it off. That sounds a way to do it. Well, that's what they did. She is right in the middle of this. And Marta and I, <sighs> brings tears to my mind even now. We said, you know what? We're going to be there because love compels us when some was in, in need. And we drove longer in one day than we ever have. We drove from Ontario to Seattle in one day, 1,200 miles. We left at four in the morning. We got off the freeway at 10.30 at night as, they were, as the freeway was filling up with protesters. We got moved off the freeway. We spent the next two days relocating our daughter. And, and praying her through this transition. And we were there three days just working our, our hearts out, working our tails off to make sure that she was safe. And then we turned around on the fifth day and we drove home in one day. It was just craziness. You know what it was? It was love incarnate. Because love compels you to do things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. And that is the heart of God in Jesus Christ. That's why God made this journey and came to where we were when we couldn't reach him. There's a song called Reckless Love by a guy named Corey Asbury. Some of you know this song. But I love this song. It says, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down. It fights till I'm found. It leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. That's what this journey 
is all about. Well, imagine making this greatest journey of all time, God coming to earth. There's a sad part to it, and it's in verse, uh, verses 10 to 13. It says, Jesus, he was in the world, and, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Can you imagine that? Jesus was the creator of all of these people. They had been called as the people of God. And Jesus came and it says they didn't even know him. Didn't recognize him. Didn't care. He wasn't the kind of God that they were looking for, the kind of Messiah they were looking for. They were looking for Captain America. They were looking for Wonder Woman. And what'd they get? A baby in a manger? Come on. Come on. What, what kind of king is that? And the people missed Jesus because he didn't look the way that they expected him to look. And I want to just challenge us, brothers and sisters, that sometimes we miss God working in our lives because we're looking for something else. We're looking for some great miracle, as Dave was talking about today. We're looking for some great miracle to take all of our woes away. And God is working in quiet ways, in baby ways, in, in gentle and quiet ways. And sometimes we just aren't quiet enough or observant enough to see what God is doing and how God comes to us. The point is, is that we need to be looking for God in a whole variety of different ways because we miss God because he doesn't look like we're all expecting. I don't know what those kids in the, the, in the cave were looking for when that first, can you imagine just that first head just kind of popping up among, uh, from the murky waters and then another one? And the kid's just like looking at him. You don't look a gift horse in the face. If someone has come all that way to rescue you, you better take them seriously. And indeed they did. And so Jesus wasn't recognized by his own people when he arrived. Will we recognize him for what he is? Final thing I want to say, and then I want to read you a story. Jesus reveals the rescue mission of God. I just That was the best way I could put it. Jesus reveals the rescue mission of God. In verse 14, the second part of that verse, I'll read the whole thing. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus came from God so that we could know God as no peoples had ever known God before. So to see Jesus was to see God in the flesh. The, the technical term there is incarnation. You know that term. Incarnation means to be in the meat, in the flesh. Jesus was God in the flesh. And he came to earth to reveal God to us. In verse 18, it says, God... God, the one and only, referring to Jesus, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. And so, when we see Jesus, when we see Jesus' response, when we see his love and his compassion, when we see his selfless love, and we see him on the cross dying for the sins of humanity, we see God as he truly is. It says... Jesus revealed God's glory as his one and only, or his only begotten. This Jesus came as the very Son of God. He had the very essence, the very substance, the very DNA, if you will, of God. And he came to reveal to us the truth and the grace of God. I could give a whole sermon. Actually, I've done a sermon on truth and grace. But he came from the Father full of grace and truth. The truth is something we can't deny that is true about ourselves. We are lost. That's the truth that Jesus came to show us. But he came full of grace. 
Grace is something we can't earn or achieve for ourselves. We need someone to save us. We may be trying to dig ourselves out of the cave. (laughs) Nothing's going to happen until someone comes to save us. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus himself said, I have come to seek and to save the lost. Well, that's a great mission statement right there. That was the whole point of Jesus coming. That's the whole point of Christmas. The whole point. God has come for me and for you. The greatest journey of all is to rescue us. And I want to ask you here before I read my story is, what do you need rescuing from? Where, do you, where are you lost in this whole journey? Do you need to be rescued from unforgiveness or from, from loneliness or fear or addiction? Do you need to be rescued from an unhealthy relationship or a failing marriage or financial ruin? or a life that's a mess, or a confused sexual identity? What is it that you need God to rescue you from? Because Jesus has come to do just that. And if you've seen enough movies, you know that you don't receive rescuing just by sitting there and and just kind of hiding in the shadows. You see all those movies? When they see the rescuers coming... What do they do? They start hopping around on the shore. They start saying, over here, over here, over here, SOS in the sand, SOS in the snow, over here, shooting off flares. I'm lost, and now I'm found. Brothers and sisters, if you need rescuing, don't sit in the shadows anymore. Come to Jesus, because he has come for you and understands every bit that you need to be saved from. And now a story. And hopefully I've made my point, but I want to return to this greatest journey of all. It's called Meditation. It's by an author named Ken Geyer. He's in Texas. I don't know much about him, but I've always liked his retelling of the Christmas story. There's a sense of beauty in it to me. And it just kind of describes the amazing journey that God went on in order to come and save us from ourselves. And so this is just called meditation. It's about three minutes long, so I hope you like it as much as I do. The night is still when Joseph creaks open the stable door. As he does, a chorus of barn animals makes discordant note of the intrusion. The stench is pungent and humid. There have not been enough hours in the day to tend the guests, let alone the livestock. A small oil lamp lent them by the innkeeper flickers to dance shadows on the walls a disquieting place for a woman in the throes of childbirth. Far from home, far from family, far from what she had expected for her firstborn. But Mary makes no complaint. It's just a relief to finally get off the road. She leans back against the wall, her feet swollen, back aching, contractions growing stronger and closer together. Joseph's eyes dart around the stable. Not a minute to lose. Quickly, a feeding trough would have to make do for a crib. Hay would serve as a mattress, blankets, blankets, ah, his robe. That would do. And those rags hung out to dry, those will help. A gripping contraction doubles Mary over and sends him racing for a bucket of water. The birth would not be easy, either for the mother or the child, for every royal privilege for this son had ended at conception. A scream from Mary knifes through the calm of the silent night. Joseph returns, breathless, water sloshing from the wooden bucket. The top of the baby's head has already pushed its way into the world. Sweat pours from Mary's contorted face as Joseph, the most unlikely midwife in all Judea, rushes to her side. 
The involuntary contractions are not enough. And Mary has to push with all of her strength, almost as if God were refusing to come into the world without her help. Joseph places a garment beneath her, and with a final push and a long sigh, her labor is over. The Messiah has arrived. Elongated head, elongated head from the constricting journey through the birth canal. Light skin as the pigment would take days or even weeks to surface. Mucus in his ears and nostrils, wet and slippery from the amniotic fluid. The son of the Most High God, umbilically tied to a lowly Jewish girl, imagine. The baby chokes and coughs. Joseph instinctively turns him over and clears his throat. And then he cries. Mary bears her breast and reaches for the shivering baby. She lays him on her chest and his helpless cries subside. His tiny head bobs around in the unfamiliar terrain. This will be the first thing the infant king learns. Mary can feel his heart, his racing heartbeat as he gropes to nurse. Deity nursing from a young maiden's breast. Could anything be more puzzling or more profound? <laughs> Joseph sits exhausted, silent, full of wonder. The baby finishes in sighs, the divine word reduced to a few unintelligible sounds. Then for the first time, his eyes fix on his mother's. Deity straining to focus, the light of the world squinting. Tears pool in her eyes. She touches his tiny hand, and hands that once sculpted mountain ranges cling to her finger. She looks up at Joseph, and through her tears, their souls touch. He crowds closer, cheek to cheek, with his betrothed. Together, they stare in awe at the baby Jesus, whose heavy eyelids begin to close. It's been a long journey. The king is tired. And so with barely a ripple of notice, God stepped into the warm lake of humanity without protocol and without pretension. Thus, in the little town of Bethlehem, that one silent night, the royal birth of God's son tiptoed quietly by as the earth slept.
Let me just close with these words. Stop digging. Stop digging. Jesus has come to you. And all he asks is that you stop digging for yourself and start believing in him. Whatever it is you need rescuing from, whatever it is that is holding you captive deep in the cave of your life, stop digging and receive the light that has come to you. Believe on him. Ask him into your heart. Ask him for his help. And he will be the light of the world and the life to you that you need. Let's pray. Thank you, God. Thank you for that beautiful song at the end. Come and see what God has done. What a wonderful statement to say. In all of our strivings, maybe Christmas is mostly just about stopping and saying thank you for what you have done, for reaching out to us in our lostness, for embarking on the greatest journey of all and coming to us in flesh at our point of need. God, be with us the rest of this week and the rest of this year. May our lives and our celebrations bring glory to you. Uh, be family to those who are not able to get together with family. Help us to love one another with the love that gives of itself that we see in you. Mostly, God, may we be people who proclaim the good news of Jesus who came to save us from our sins. Thank you, God. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. And brothers and sisters, I want to say a Merry Christmas to all of you. If any of you would like prayer, I'll do a, I'll do a uh, socially appropriately distanced prayer with you because if you need some rescuing this morning, you sense God calling you to come into greater relationship with Jesus, I'd like to talk to you. I'd like to pray with you. God bless you. Have a blessed Christmas in the Lord.